This evening we're going to be looking at that of trials and blessings. If, go, if you would, go ahead and, and turn in your Bibles, uh, number uh, to James chapter 5 and verse 10. Cha- uh, James 5 and verse 10. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. There's patience involved in this. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Job is an example. He is an an enormous example of uh, suffering as someone who is put on trial, someone who goes through uh, uh, an, an ordeal that uh, takes everything away from Job, everything except his life, takes away everything. And Job is going to be uh, accompanied, he's going to be surrounded by uh, friends that aren't so good friends. They, they are good for a little bit until they begin throwing accusations at him that this would not be happening except you are a sinner. You must be a, a monstrous sinner for this to happen. And the book goes through. Uh, Actually, we know what occurred from chapter 1. We know what was going on behind the scenes, but no one on this earth could have known it at the time. Not Job, not anybody. But we see where there there is grief in the world. There's trials, there's tribulation, but it also must be met by patience and perseverance because there are blessings that are intended in it. There is a strengthening that is going to be a direct result of it. Now, we can take any problem, any situation that comes our way, any situation, whether it's a problem or not, any situation that comes our way, and we can become worse for it, or we can become better for it. We can take it, however, we can take any blessing and become worse, just by our own choice. We can take any problem and become better. It's by our own choice. By our own choice we can do this. But here we see this uh, James speaking, first off, about the prophets, who they are an example of patience. They went through all kinds of suffering, and there is patience that is there. And Job also showed extraordinary patience through it all. And Though Job wanted to know the reason why he was going through all this and considered himself as being innocent and considered himself as as, uh, being unjustly hit by all these problems, uh, he never sinned with his lips and God allowed him to question such things. Uh, But God is going to come in at at the end of Job and it's going to set things correct. Going to put Job, really put Job in perspective as to the, the whole scheme of things that, that Job doesn't know everything. Job is, is uh, there's a lot of things Job doesn't know at all. But let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, we're actually in this chapter on Wednesday mornings. We haven't gotten to this section yet. But here is, in Hebrews, uh, we have individuals from the Old Testament and the faith that they have is being shown by the actions that they do in faith. Whether it's Noah, whether it's Abraham, whether it is, is Abel. Okay. That the things that they did are a direct result of their faith, that their faith does have substance. Faith has substance, and it's shown by the actions done. But we come to a section that I call the other and still other section, and this this follows uh, really a section where we see we see like. Uh, uh, closed the mouth, mouths of lions and, and sent the enemies in, in, on route and, and things of victory of where people who went through this, such as Daniel or, or uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Gabriel, that, not Gabriel, but Gideon, 
that they lived to tell about it. They were put into these situations. God brought them out of that, and they lived to tell about it. But there is a section here of where the people, some of them didn't live to tell about it. They didn't live to tell about it, but God still took care of them. Not that he spared their lives on this earth, but they become martyrs, and he's on the other side. Now, we go to verse 35. So we're in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35. Verse 35 begins with uh, this first part, which women receive their dead raised to life again. Okay, so that's, that's another thing where there is... Uh, there is a, a ha we can call it a, a good ending or a happy ending uh, of where uh, something has occurred. Yes, it's miraculous. Yes. And God took care of the situation. But there is also the other side that begins with this. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Now, this is a different ending in, in this. This is a difficult ending. But God took care of them nonetheless. And when God tells us to be faithful unto death, that's precisely what He means. That not every day is going to see us living to the next day. And not every trial we go through is guaranteed that we're going to live through that trial to tell the tale the next day. That we may very well be in a trial that, yeah, it's, it's terminal. That th this particular trial leads to death. But is that bad? Well, if we're faithful unto death, it is wonderful. It is a good thing. But we continue on. All right, so we have, we have these who are, they're tortured. Verse 36, still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Now, with that, the idea is to kill the person, and they were killed. Granted, Paul was stoned but he got up and went back into town, okay? They're sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, were one, uh, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All these have obtained a good testimony through, th through faith, did not receive the promise, verse 40, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Okay, now, there is a reward for them. And while they didn't go through some of the things that, that others did, we can go back to uh, verse 33 who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Okay, all of those things are, it's victory. Harm was meant, but harm was not really inflicted. Not very far anyway. Harm really wasn't inflicted, that these people came through those trials and there is a victory that is obvious to everybody. But we come down to these others and still others, well, they have a victorious ending too, even though, even though they died, even though some were stoned, sawn in two, slain by the sword, their ending is victorious as well. Let's go to the book of Revelation. If we go to the book of Revelation and go to chapter 6, here is the, a vision. A, the uh, fifth seal is, is broken by the Lamb of God. 
there is a scroll written inside and out, sealed with seven seals. It's in the right hand of the one who's on that throne. That's an important scroll. That's an important scroll. And no one was worthy to so much as touch that scroll. But one is worthy, and that is that line of Judah, the Lamb of God, is able to take it, and he is able to break those seals. And he does one by one. Each time he breaks a seal, John sees something. He sees something. And each one of them has a meaning. And we can argue about all these meanings, but we have to go to what is the lesson? That's the important part. What is the lesson? Not so much the who, the what, the when, and the where, but the lesson. Are we getting that? So, verse 9. So we're in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, look at this, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. This is exactly the same sort of people we just read about in Hebrews chapter 11. Those who we don't know their names because there's too many to name. Evidently, others and still others, there's a lot to be named. And some of them, we might recognize their names, some of them. We, you know, it is traditionally thought that Jeremiah may have been one of those, but there's no way to really know that. Nevertheless, we see where uh, these have been slain and they are, they are seen by John. And they cried out, verse 10, and they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then, so they're calling for vengeance. They are among the dead. They've been martyred. And they're calling for justice to be done. How long are, is this going to continue? How long till you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Verse 11, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So it's not done yet. It's not done yet. And we come back to the, the words in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That this, this killing, this martyrdom that was taking place can continue through time, indefinitely, until this world is brought to an end. But... Notice, while they are calling for justice, who's taking care of them? Well, God is taking care of them. And they're just fine. Matter of fact, they're, they're in the best place possible. They are in the best place possible. And there will be justice done, but they're told to wait. It's not through yet. Just wait. It will be done. And when we're talking about the span of eternity, which can't be measured. Waiting a little bit longer is nothing in the span of eternity. It's nothing. Because waiting a couple of centuries, that's nothing. Waiting for a thousand years, two thousand years, five thousand years, twenty thousand years, that's nothing. Waiting for, just I'm just throwing out big numbers, Waiting 10 billion years is nothing in the scope of eternity. That there is going to be, no matter what the span is, what is done after that into eternity is far greater and by an infinite number. <laughs> well, it really, by infinity is what it is greatly out distance, greatly to where whatever the wait time is, 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 is meaningless. It really is compared to eternity itself. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 5. We have been studying this 
uh, in our class on Wednesday night. In Acts chapter 5, we have the apostles. They have been arrested by the court. Uh, and they, the, you have the Sanhedrin court. They're not happy at all that the apostles continue to preach in the name of Jesus. They're not happy about that. They actually thought all this would stop. They thought they could put it to an end, but it's not ending. And Gamaliel gives advice to that court, and it's very sound advice, and they really don't take the advice fully. The advice is, and Gamaliel knows some historical things that they would all remember. They would all know what they were. And you have uh, Thutis is, is one of them. You have that of Judas of Galilee is another. That each of them had their own following. Each of them, both of them I should say, had uh, claimed to be someone and eventually the whole thing just fell apart. And Gamaliel's advice is, leave these men alone. That's his advice. That's what it comes down to. They won't leave them alone. That's what I say that they're not really taking his advice, but leave them alone. He says, if this is for men, it'll come to nothing. You don't have to worry about it. It'll just fizzle and fade, and that's it. All right, then it'll be done. But if it's from God, you're going to find yourself fighting against God. Now, it is, I'm impressed that Gamaliel actually admitted it was a possibility. Now, that's not saying that Gamaliel changed his ways and became a Christian, followed Christ, because we don't know that. But I am impressed that he allowed for that possibility that these men could be from God. As far as the rest were concerned, that wasn't a possibility. At least they wouldn't vocalize it. They're not about to say such a thing, but he does. But they can't leave him alone. They just cannot. It's like they can't help themselves. They bring him out and they got to beat him. They tell him, don't preach this anymore. Now, what happens... After they have been, verse 40, let's just, Acts chapter 5, verse 40. And they agreed with him, they agreed with him, yeah, it was sort of. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. For, so, so much for leaving them alone. Or leaving them alone is just, what that means is, let them go. Just let them go. Because there is the possibility this is from God. No, they're not going to do that. We've got to beat them first. Okay, so they're, they're going to do that. Now here, verse 41, So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame in His name. They considered it an honor that this had occurred to them. You know, there is something that is said that you can know someone by the friends they have. You can also know someone by the enemies they have, the people who do not like them at all. You can know something about them. And, you know, if, if you have God being a friend to someone, I, that's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. Jesus, the Son of God, being a, a friend to someone, that's saying a lot. And Satan being the enemy of that someone and a, a wicked court being an enemy of someone, that, that lets you know a lot of things about that person. And here they considered it a, uh, an honor that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They didn't stop. They knew they were on the right track. They knew they were doing the right thing. And it was actually, they are to, we ought to obey God rather than men. They had to address that in chapter 5 verse 29. 
in the previous chapter, chapter 4, they just asked the question, which is right for us to obey men or God? In chapter 5, they tell them directly, all right, we got to obey God. They don't offer the question of you judge, all right, because you're not judging properly is what it comes down to. That here is the answer, we're going to obey God rather than men. We're going to obey God. And so they go, but they go rejoicing, rejoicing after being beaten. Now, it would not have been a joyful thing. I mean, typically you wouldn't think that such a thing, and it wasn't that they weren't beaten very badly. It wasn't that they... They, uh, that it wasn't really meant or that they held back anything, because I don't think they did. Not in the beatings, they didn't hold back. Not the Sanhedrin court. Because they meant what they meant. And that is, you don't, you don't preach in this name anymore, and we don't want to catch you doing it anymore. Like I said, so much for leaving them alone. But let's go now to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we have... Paul speaking about the things that he had to go through in life. And once again, you have trials that we can all expect. Trials that are just going to be. And in every trial, we can take it and we can go further away from God or we can take it and we can grow closer to God. We can take it and, be, and grow weak, just, just wither away, or we can take it and grow stronger, more resilient, more determined, more faithful. We can do that. And you know, some people, you can, you can see, uh, let's, just, let's just make this two people, two people going through the, the same sort of thing. And one, one saying, I went through this and I'm okay. I went through this and it was an experience that I can use for later. That I have gone through this and I am stronger and better for it. The other person saying, I went through this, why did God put me through this? I went through this and this was horrible. I no longer have any loyalties to God because He did this to me. Well, I've met people like that, and there's a, there's a lot of folks that they turn away from God off of just an emotional response, just that of resentment for what could have been used to strengthen them. They saw it as just an affront. They saw it as an attack. They saw it as it's an inconvenience. They'd prefer a life of, of comfort but life doesn't always bring that. And because of that, they resented it and, and left God. Now, we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We begin in verse 22. And we have a discussion in this of uh, Paul talking about the things that he has gone through. And, and verse 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. He can, he can match up you know, uh, his resume with anybody else. All right, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. You know, I've, I've done that. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. Now, he's writing this, but this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. We never need to forget that. When he says, in labors more abundant, that's the Holy Spirit confirming that's the truth. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Now notice, this from the Jews, five times that happened to him. All right. Now, he's not saying that three of those was with rods. That's different. This is a different three times. Five times with the Jews. Three times, this would have been somebody else, probably the Romans. This would have been somebody else. 
Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. All right, just stop right there. That's a lot to have to go through. That is, that's a lot of sleepless nights. And that's a lot of, of uh, trials in, in all of these. And I have to say that the, these perils of, of waters, okay, things that, that are of nature, perils of nature, don't bother me near as much as perils that come from men. All right, because one is a thing of nature, the other is a, a thing of wickedness. But the perils of men don't bother me as much as from, from strangers as it is from someone who's not such a stranger. When he talks about perils among false brethren, well, that is a far greater peril in my mind, far worse than any of these others, because it's someone who's betraying, because that's what it is, someone who's infiltrated, someone who's working is rather seditiously with uh, trying to undermine faith, trying to destroy the church from within. That's false brethren. They're not actually brethren. They're false teachers. They're, they are there, those wolves in sheep's clothing. Verse 27, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other thing, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Now notice, there's not a bit of resentment in all that. There's not any resentment. There's no bitterness. He hasn't just said, okay, I quit. You, you just deal with yourselves. Whatever happens, happens. I have nothing to do with this anymore. He's still concerned for all the churches. Now that is dedication, and that's love. It is love for God, and it's love for mankind. That's precisely what it is. And here is this constant diligence that is required and that he has. All these perils, all these things that have happened to him, they have made him stronger. And he is just as concerned for the churches as he ever was, and perhaps even more so. He's just as strong for helping out in teaching the gospel, in doing works of righteousness as he ever was, and perhaps even more more so. I think there's a good argument for the, the more so in all of that. Now, let's go to Matthew, and we, we end this by going to uh, what Jesus has to say. And we go to Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 34. Matthew 10 and verse 34. And this is an assurance, as Christ often gave assurances to his followers of various things, of various sorts. And it's assurances that not everyone is going to obey. Matter of fact, he's going to say most people won't obey. And that's precisely what has happened. But also that there will always be persecutions. That's an assurance. That's just going to happen. And it does happen. But verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now he's talking metaphorically here. Because Jesus did say later, if my kingdom were of this earth, then my servants would fight. And that's, that was just another, another assurance that if this were the case, if my kingdom were of this earth, my servants would fight at this moment. They would be doing it. 
What does that mean? His kingdom's not of this earth. And his servants aren't going to be fighting. Now they're going to have a sword, but it's going to be not one of metal. It's going to be one of words. And it is the most powerful weapon on the earth because it changes lives from the, from the soul within, from the heart within. It changes lives, not out of the threat of death, but a love toward God and a repentance that comes by the words of God and someone discovering that they're on the wrong side of things. Now, he says, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword. Verse 35, For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. How is that? Because there will be people who will believe they will follow Christ, but those closest to them, children, wife, in-laws, those closest to them in his own household may not follow they may be dead set against Christ. And Jesus assures us that this can happen. Assures us that this will happen, not necessarily to everybody, but that this will happen. And we see this. He who lo verse 37, He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Are we to love our father and mother? Yes. Honor them. Yes. Where honor is due. That is still required. That is still required. But loving them more than God? No. No one, no one on this earth, however close you may be, no one on this earth is to be between you and God. Nobody. And there's some folks that need to understand that. Nobody is in between you and God. There was a young lady, she, had, she was a, a recent convert. This was years ago. She came to me and she said that, her, of course, her, her, parents, her parents were not believers in the least. They were just basically your, your worldly type. I don't know that they were just entirely ungodly, but they were worldly, and they didn't want her going to church anymore. And she says, I've got to obey them, right? And we looked at this, and that no one has a right or an authority to say, you can't worship God or to put a barrier, or to be a barrier between you and God. Nobody, that is not father, mother, that is not your spouse, that's not anybody. No one, no one has that right, regardless of what authority they may have. The authority of a parent doesn't have that. The authority that a husband has, it's not there. The authority that a, a police officer or a government official may have. They can't get in between us and God. No one can. And here he says, we begin in verse 37 again, He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. That, I don't know how many times I've been in a Bible study where I know it's an emotional reaction of some, an emotional reaction of some, when they begin to see the truth, and the truth is on the page, and they are reading it, they realize that's not what mom did at all, or that's not what dad did at all. Matter of fact, I don't know anybody in my family who did this. I don't know anybody. And there's an emotional reaction that can occur of where they immediately reject it because they would rather father mom and dad and unfortunately follow them 
to hell than to seek their own salvation. That what they did, somehow what they did, the, their parents or grandparents, somehow what they did is greater than Scripture. How is that? How is that? Now, God's going to deal with those that have gone before. We can't bother with that. We can't correct that. But what we can do is make correction from what we know. And perhaps they were never taught like they should have been. Perhaps they were kept in the dark. I can't answer that. But now that we're getting out of the dark, let's be people of the light. Let's make correction. Some people will, some will not. They become quite angry. But you're getting angry at God, not at the one asking you to read the passage. You're getting angry, they're getting angry at God. Now, let's, let's continue in this. Verse 38. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now, he says this prior to being crucified. So this could be kind of a mystery as to what this means. It'd be kind of a mystery to those, but they understand what a cross is. They, they know what that is. Uh, there's, no, there's no mystery to that. But this means that there will be persecutions. You take up your cross and follow him. That is, accept the persecutions that are going to come. Exactly as parable of the sower teaches. Now there's a type of ground when persecutions arise, which is going to happen. Just like there's going to be a hot sun, <laughs> there's going to be persecutions for those who follow Christ. And yep, that faith withers away. And here we see that if we're not willing to take up our cross and follow Him, we're not worthy of Him. Verse 39, He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Just like those from Hebrews chapter 11, those others that they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were slain by the sword, they found their life. Just like those in Revelation chapter 6 with those martyrs that, that John sees, they found their life. They're not being treated ill just because they're told to wait. Justice is coming, just not yet. And there's no escape from the justice. There's no escape whatsoever. Justice is going to occur. But just like those martyrs, you can have a Saul of Tarsus who is in full compliance of killing Christians. He is fully accepting Saul of Tarsus as seeing that as his duty to bring it about. But he changes his life. Mercy and grace are given to him as well. So here's another part to it with those martyrs that yes, while there will be justice, there may be some who they killed you but they may be among you in time. They may also be among you. And God knows far more than we do, and God, which is a good thing, because He's going to be the one bringing about the judgment. Christ is going to be the one who's going to judge righteously. Now, our lives can be met with all kinds of trials. And each one of us, each one of us holds our place. And in that place, each one of us can think that we have been done wrong, can think that, 
that, uh, uh, that we have not been treated fairly by God or tr that, that things have, have come our way and resent that or we can see it as a trial and grow from it. Receive it as, receive it for what it's meant to put us to the test, see what we're made of, and God will never bring anything on us we cannot bear. Which means, there's, there's comfort to that, that whatever we're going through, we can bear it. It can seem like we can't, but we can. We can bear it. God knows what we can take and what we can't take. And He knows the level. He knows what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and it's up to us to take it and grow by it. God does not want heaven filled with spoiled children. He doesn't want that. And that's exactly what we can become. He doesn't want people who are just heaven filled with the unrighteous, with the, the lawless. He doesn't want that. Or the, those that have, have just uh, uh, emptied themselves of all faith, emptying themselves of, of uh, any kind of, of uh, opportunity or, or anything that, that might come around and be inconvenient because they happen to be a Christian. That they want to avoid all that and they will avoid it by denying Christ. They will avoid that by removing themselves from faith. God doesn't want to fill heaven with people like that. But He does want righteousness out of us. And every person on this earth is capable of it. Everybody. We need these words, these words to strengthen us, to encourage us, to bring us through what life may bring us. And God is there all the way wanting us to get through these tests wanting us to get on the other side and welcome us home this evening we ask if you need to respond to the invitation that you come as we stand and sing